heart of where innovation, money, and power collide in Silicon Valley and beyond. This is Bloomberg Technology with Caroline Hyde and Ed Ludlow. I'm Shanali Basak at Bloomberg's World Headquarters in New York. Ed Ludlow is off today and Caroline Hyde is live at the NASDAQ. This is Bloomberg Technology. Coming up, we are live from NASDAQ to bring you full coverage of the ARM IPO as it makes its trading debut as the biggest IPO of the year. More ahead. And as ARM makes its trading debut, we'll push ahead to the other companies lining up to go public during our venture capital spotlight. We'll also look at the prospects and use case for digital dollars with former head of the CFTC, Chris John Carlo. All that and more coming up next. Now, before we head over to the NASDAQ, where Caroline Hyde is standing by with a very senior executive, we are also getting indications that ARM may open shortly in the next 10 to 15 minutes. We are getting price indications of about $56, give or take $56.30. That would give the firm a valuation of about $60 billion. Let's see where we head, though, Caroline. Caroline, uh, we are heading over now to Caroline and Karen Snow, Senior VP and Global Head of Listings over at NASDAQ. Shanali, thank you so much. And yes, I am sat here with Karen and wow, we're back at it. We've almost forgotten how the IPOs work. It's very exciting. How important is this arm listing for the rest of the companies that now stand to list? I think you were saying, what, 157 are there waiting to come to the market? Mm-hmm. It's important. It needs to trade well. I think that um, this is a moment in time that everyone is really paying attention. The markets have been open uh, for great companies for some time now when you look at the VIX and the secondary market and what we're seeing in the private markets. But it's really been on the supply side. Mm -hmm. uh, And ARM is really uh, set to, to unlock that. What's so interesting about ARM is how idiosyncratic it is, Mm -hmm. or not, because many want this to be a bellwether. It's in the tipping point of AI, but also China anxiety. But what's so interesting is it's only a little free float, less than 10%. How easy or hard is it, therefore, to square up demand and supply at this moment? Is anyone going to want to be a seller? What's happening behind the scenes? Yeah, well, that is why it's taking a little bit of time to open. Uh, It's really important to get the opening cross right. Uh, And one of the things that we do is we provide technology to uh, the the person opening the stock, and that's J.P. Morgan in this case. It's called the stabilization agent. Mm -hmm. Uh, And we've turned it into more of a science than an art. There still is an art, though. Uh, And you want enough buyers and sellers in that opening cross uh, and to price the opening at a level that it'll trade well. When you have that sort of technology, is that's what wooing the likes of Arm, the likes of Instacart are looking to come with the NASDAQ as well. How do you set yourself apart from some of the other exchanges in this moment? Right. Well, it is a part of it, I would say. Um, we do find that uh, the underwriters have more information, and that's really helpful to them. Uh, but there are other factors, obviously. I would say brand alignment is really important. Uh, the fact that we have an own, own and operate our differentiated services. Uh, so we really build relationships with our companies throughout their life cycle. At the moment, the pushes and the pulls of deciding to go public. In general, I mean, I cast my mind back to when Arm first went public back in the 90s. There were a lot more companies that were public at that point. There's been this sort of desire to be away from the fiduciary duties that you have to shareholders. The the costs. How does it look as a company looking to go public at the moment? Is it desirable? We would say so, Um, and we do a lot of work with the SEC and advocacy work on behalf of our issuers really around that because our objective is to keep, uh, we want high quality companies coming, but we want to focus on the issues that are really important, uh, and we want the cost to remain reasonable for companies. To that end, so when you've got, they're looking at compliance costs, they're looking at volatility more broadly in the market. You said that looks pretty good at the moment, VIX remaining low. What therefore could be the catalysts into 2024? When are we going to see windows open and closed, do you think? Yeah, well, I think ARM is likely to open a window here. Uh, And I think a lot of companies are ready to go public. Q2 
4 will probably be a lot more interesting, mm -hmm. and a lot of companies want to go in the first half of 24, really getting ahead of the election. Okay, so there's sort of political risk within that. At this moment, there's geopolitical risk, and it's interesting that, of course, Arm has exposure, exposure to China. You are head of global listings. How are you seeing the overall pushes and pulls of, of the global narrative right now? Yeah. Well, there's a lot of interest from global companies, mm -hmm. a lot of interest from Chinese companies listing in the U.S., Latin America, EMEA. Uh, the market's really open in the United States, and it's, it's very recognized. I mean, the LSE recognizes this at this moment because yes. it was it's a bitter pill for the London Stock Exchange to swallow today that they didn't manage to woo arm there, given it's a UK-based company. But I'm interested you say China and mm. companies still want to come here. Are they not worried in any way about the closing of investor base to China, particularly in this current political environment? Yeah, I would just say it's a tricky time. Uh, but I think everyone recognizes that the US markets are the most liquid and everyone has to consider them when they're going public, regardless of where they are in the world. When we're looking at the companies that could come after in the next week or so, the Instacarts, the Clayviews, I'm, I'm interested in what is the recipe? Is a company having to demonstrate profit growth, having to demonstrate revenue growth to be able to access the market right now? I would say yes to both of those, and they also have to be priced at a valuation. Uh, that accommodates for that growth or not. Mm -hmm. What about the overall desire, it feels like, of Masayoshi Son himself not wanting to go to the very top of a range he could have done? Mm -hmm. Did that speak to wanting to ensure that this share pop? And then what is the perfect price point there for? How yeah. do you see that art rather than science? Yeah, I think his view is long term, right? It's the right thing to do for the long term. Uh, and I think you'll find that investors love to, what we call it, get a little bit of a kiss and that uh, not every dollar that could have been taken is taken by the company and Arm, of course, is thinking about this for the long haul. In many ways, Arm has gone against the grain. They've had a democratization of the banks in the way in which they've been underwritten, but they've also ensured that there are those linchpin investors, the Apples, the TSMCs, the Intels who have bought up this stock. Does that make it a recipe for others to try and follow suit in that way? How difficult is it to replicate? Well, there's a lot of different factors that go into a company's decision and how they put their book together, who their partners are. There's no one recipe that works for everybody is what I would say. It really depends on the company, the advice that they're getting, and the decisions that they decide to make around that. And interesting, of course, Arm is very much a B2B play we're going to see some more B2C names. Retail investors become important at that moment. We think back to the mean stock crazes and the heady days of 2021. Will the retail investor be as crucial going into this next era of IPO we're opening? Yeah, I wouldn't say that they're crucial, but they. what is important to recognize about the retail investor is they weren't an important part necessarily for a long period of time. They've become much more active, mm. and I think it's exciting, and, and it does democratize the process, and everyone's able to participate, and so many more people got educated or took the time to get educated about the public markets and what mm. that can really mean about your overall wealth. Karen Snow, it's been so wonderful. You're hosting us here. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. It's great to have you. VP, of course, Head of Global Listings right here at the NASDAQ. It's Janali, back to you. That's Bloomberg's Caroline Hyde and Karen Snow, Senior VP and Global Head of Listings at NASDAQ. Thank you both. Now let's turn to our own Bloomberg Intelligence Analyst, Kunjan Sobani, for more on today's ARM listing. What's interesting to me is that if you look at the price indications at about $56 per share, that implies a valuation about $60 billion. Does ARM have a growth rate that justifies that type of a price tag? Well, not in the near term, but definitely in the long term. But the valuation implies that in investors are underwriting the long term growth that it is expected to achieve from the fast growing markets of data center, AI, and automotive, where the company is just getting started mm -hmm. versus Good where run. the company. 
We actually are going to uh, go, go to the Arm Holdings actual price for a second before we get back to you on the valuation because we are getting Arm trading live at $56.10 a share. That is uh, more than $5 above its IPO price. There is your IPO pop that you're seeing for Arm Holdings. Remember, this is a fairly thin float that you were seeing for Arm, so it did take a couple of hours to get the first trade moving for the underwriters and stabilization agent to make sure that the book was built just in time and it is just about as smooth a day you could have for an IPO in a year where we've had virtually no IPOs. At $56.10 a share, you are looking at a company that is worth about $60 billion. That is about $59.9 billion, uh, $59 billion in terms of valuation for ARM. We're going to turn now to Bloomberg's Abigail Doolittle to put this into perspective for us as we look for a, day, a landmark day this year for ARM and the IPO market. Absolutely, Shanali. And we do have a nice pop here for ARM right now, trading higher by about 9.4%. Of course, priced at $51. There was the possibility that they were going to price it at $52, $53, $54. But CEO uh, Matsuo Sasan wanted to make sure that they weren't too greedy. And it seems like he and the bankers did a good job right now, 10% above, uh, raising uh, the valuation on the actual IPO price of $51 at $54.5 billion. And of course, this is the biggest IPO of the year. And the reason that matters is because back in last year, uh, there was roughly $179 billion raised through the public uh, markets. Uh, this year, or the year prior to that, 630. There's been a drought this year. So the big question is, is this IPO, will it stay successful through the close? Right now, it looks very positive. Is it going to provide the support for Instacart next week, along with Clavio? And more importantly, Shanali, going into next year, 2024, is it going to create what investors, companies, bankers want to see relative to having the confidence that big, some big tech IPOs can go. Of course, we've had the setting over the last 12 months of rising rates, inflation. That makes some of these uh, growth stocks, uh, riskier uh, IPOs, maybe less attractive. So again, right now, we are looking at a positive opening here uh, for uh, ARM Holdings, up 9.8%, uh, an impressive IPO start right here on the day. Certainly about 10%. That is a very healthy little pop you get there from uh, the likes of Goldman, JP Morgan, Mizuho, all underwriting the deal alongside Barclays and the 20 some other banks involved in the deal. We're going to turn back now to Kunjan, so, uh, Kunjan Sobani of Bloomberg Intelligence to talk more about the valuation here because you are looking at a company at $60 billion on its first day in public markets after its ownership of, uh, after its soft bank ownership. And that implies a 22.4 times multiple to its trailing sales. What does that mean to you? I mean, this is definitely in the premium and along with the semi-design IP peers and sort of the AI companies like NVIDIA. And like I was saying, it's, it seems the investors are underwriting the future growth coming from these markets rather than the current revenue composition, which is heavily based on smartphone and consumer electronics. It's also a good day. Let's talk about that. It's a good day in the markets, Kunjan. And so they're getting a little lucky here. They have relative calm. There was no crazy CPI print yesterday. Retail sales kept the market relatively calm. The VIX is low. But there are a lot of risks on the horizon. If you are a new investor looking to arm, what are those risks that you should really be aware of impacting this valuation that we see today? Yeah, so in the near term, like I said, the, because the revenue composition is heavily relied on the smartphone and we know that smartphone Michael's market is going through a slump right now. So as they come out for the near term quarters, you know, investors will have to uh, be patient and face for some hurdles coming in the near term because those data center revenues will take time to become a significant portion of the total revenue. And the second key risk is China. Uh, from China, it's about two angles. One is the exposure and the concentration. I mean, they have 24 percentage revenues coming from China, which is not a lot or not an outlier for any large semi company. I mean, all of those have exposure in that range or even higher for a smartphone company. But the other key risk is concentration. So Arm China is their gateway to the entire China market. So every customer they sell, what they want to sell in China, they have to go through this one entity. So if something were to really go south there, um, we're talking about cutting off the entire market. So that's the two risks investor needs to brace themselves for. All or nothing feels a little risky. But at the same time here, when you think about the long term, you've said that a couple times now, how long is the long term? When do investors have to be patient until? 
I think like uh, at least about three years. I mean, today when we look at the server market specifically, their market share is in mid single digits. And in automotive, it's again, low double digits. Uh, we expect it to almost double in three to five years. And these markets are large. So even if you get a small pie of like say a data center AI market, that's still adding revenue in north of billions of dollars to a company which is almost doing close to less than three billion last year. When you think about the competitive landscape, at this point you have ARM now in public markets, SoftBank at some point will look to sell, sell more shares. How do you expect them to stack up against their competitive set when it comes to how investors will put money to work in the sector? Yeah, I mean, I think they need to continue executing on the promise that they would have delivered for that ramp in the roadshow presentation. So investors are going to be keeping key eye on how they're doing in the data center and the automotive market. So any like accelerated growth design wins there should be a tailwind for them or a headwind in absence of that. That's Bloomberg Intelligence Analyst Kunjan Sobani. Thank you so much for your time. We're going to head back down to the NASDAQ now, where Bloomberg's Caroline Hyde is getting all the latest details. But Caroline, before those details, what's the mood? It must feel pretty good to be watching an IPO pop after such a big drought. Uh, Shanali, the relief, the optimism, cautious optimism. I mean, now that they've seen this trade, you can see behind me, we're currently trading up more than 13%. It was this art and science balance that everyone has to remind themselves of. It takes a while to ensure that they've got the right amount, basically, of sellers in place. In this particular instance, the issue is, is of course, they got, what, $700 million being taken down by some really important investors who are basically customers, Apple, NVIDIA, and the like. But they've also got to ensure that some people are going to be putting the less than 10% free float up for sale at this moment and locking in some of the profits. Now, it's been a big profit for SoftBank. You know that they made about 70% on this particular purchase that they made of $32 billion for ARM back in 2016. But this is so important for the sentiment of the market. The fact that they managed to decide to go in lower, $51 was just at the top of their range. They didn't get greedy and they've decided to price it and put $56, therefore, to allow it to continue to trade higher for the rest of the day. That's what Instacart, that's what some of the other companies eyeing this market need to see. A 10% drop or pop rather looks a lot better here than an 8% pop would. Do you think this conservatism that they took in their underwriting approach to the IPO price last night is uh, what's going to be the name of the game for the companies coming up? That's what's so interesting. Is this idiosyncratic? Is this Massa, head of SoftBank, who apparently we understand due to our reporting, really took some charge in this, deciding that they weren't going to go for the $52. They were going to stick to 51 to ensure that they got that, you know, really good gauge of sentiment. He is a long-term holder of this stock. He said that time and time again. Yes, he wants to see that valuation increase in the near term, but in the longer term too, maybe, he, as you were just mentioning with your previous guest, maybe he offloads more stock, maybe he uses it as collateral for further financial engineering that we know that he is so artful at. And I think that we will see the likes of Instacart and some of the other companies eyeing, having to decide whether or not they want to take a long-term perspective, leave a little bit of money on the table to ensure that their company comes with a good set of pop into the market that then continues to have that demand side. We know that there's loads of concerns, geopolitical risks being one of them, anxiety around interest rates. This mm -hmm. has been a volatile market for a long time time. People have been waiting for this IPO window to open and they want to see it continue to be open until, as we heard Karen Snow say, before the elections of next year. Bloomberg's Caroline Hyde, we thank you so very much for all your time and what perfect timing we have had you at the top of the show while the stock has opened. Now let's continue the conversation on venture capital and bring in Bloomberg's Katie Roof because what a win <laughs> for SoftBank. They needed a win. And so them having this on the books now, what does it mean for not only their portfolio company but also the, the appetite for other VCs who are now looking to get some money back on the table for themselves? Sure, yeah. So I think, you know, this is obviously a positive sign for tech broadly. Uh, you know, we have Clavio coming up next week. We have Instacart coming up next week. And so we want to see public investors or they want to see public investors with enthusiasm for tech stocks. I would say that a 10% pop isn't a big pop. I mean, typically you would see 20 to 30% pop on day one. I mean, there have been times that it's gone higher, but uh, usually the goal is, is a little bit higher than 10%. But, you know, 
the fact that it went up is good because there aren't a lot of tech stocks that have gone up in the last 18 months. This is the, the only big tech IPO we've had since 2021. So people are watching this one closely even though it is a pretty different sector than a lot of the other tech companies and certainly the venture back companies. What about the approach? We're talking a little bit about pricing, but what about ownership? In this instance, SoftBank is only floating about 10%. In the last 24 hours, a lot of agitas about their, uh, about VCs holding on too long into an IPO. Investors want their money back. <laughs> so do you expect more investors to start doing that? Yeah, sometimes we've seen this, like, you know, it's called a low float IPO where you just take a small percentage of the company and release it to the public. And that is actually often designed to help ensure a better pop um, because, you know, if you limit supply, then um, it can it kind of artificially uh, raise demand. And so um, we've seen that in the past. I think that right now, certainly most tech companies would probably be wise to price these things conservatively, or at least that's what people are telling me. Uh, because, yeah, you know, it can, if you, if you make a bad first impression on the market, it can spook investors in the long run. Katie, I've got to say, it's so nice to have you in New York for a big listening in New York from an international company. <laughs> but also I know that You've been kind of running around doing a lot of reporting. I got to do a little bit of the reporting with you. What's the new name of the game? It's not just about profitability, is it, when we think about the companies that are looking to list? And the window doesn't seem to be as open as people think it is. Yeah, that's a big question on everyone's minds right now because VCs tend to be growth investors. They really look at companies with top line revenue growth. And that was what public investors seemed to be interested in a couple years ago. But then there's been a perception that that changed and that they care more about profitability. But VCs will tell you that that's at odds with growth because if you have to cut, you know, your sales and marketing to be profitable, then that will, you know, reduce your growth rates. And so we see with Instacart that they are profitable in line with what the perception of what tech public investors want, but they have had slowed growth. And so that's going to be one that people are watching. Um, you have Clavio on the other hand where they're both growing and profitable. So We'll see. How do you think about the next week ahead? I've, obviously, the bankers are going to be very busy on road shows for both of these companies. What's the timeline? Yeah, so I mean, right now we have the road shows for Instacart and Clavio underway, and they're both scheduled to go next week um, around the same time. So another thing also that has just happened is Databricks raising more money at a $43 billion valuation, I believe. What does this mean? Because you saw other companies kind of raise money pre-IPO. Does it change the pre-IPO kind of appetite as well? Yeah, so a lot of companies, other than AI companies, pretty much no one has been able to raise at high valuations or at least even flat valuations in the last year or so. There's been very, very few. Uh, Databricks is a company that has a lot of investor interest. So even though the price is already high, they've been able to sustain that. Um, typically, when I see a company like this raising money, I think they're not on the verge of IPO. I mean, certainly they could go public in the next year, but you wouldn't want to dilute your ownership in the next few months before an IPO unless you were going to do a direct listing. That is Bloomberg's Katie Roof. We thank you so very much for your time. We want to give you an update as well on where Arm is trading. We are looking at that IPO pop still holding. Now, listen, remember, this has been rising as much as 15%. We are seeing some of those gains a little bit volatile, but remember, we did see initially that pop of about 10%. If you take a look at trading now, we are looking at a stock now very much up more than $60 a share. This was a stock that was priced at $51. It was was a Masa son that himself told the bankers that he wanted to keep this more conservatively priced. They tried to bring it up about a dollar to fifty-two dollars a share, but bringing it down uh, has not only given it that initial pop. It, it is a little more than what it would have been if they priced it higher. Now, remember also to the point that our own Katie Roof was making: there have certainly been bigger pops in history, but there were questions coming into this IPO from the beginning about the valuation itself. So you, you know what? This is something that is stacking, stacking up for a win for the underwriters and certainly for SoftBank. Now let's get more context from Bloomberg's Ian King. Ian, when you take, take a look at the competitive dynamics that Arm is facing, why do you think that it is getting such a warm reaction in public markets? 
Well, I mean, there are a couple of things here going on, Sonali. There are the, the setup of the mechanics of the IPO itself. Remember, this is just a very small portion of the company that's being offered. There are strategic investors already involved. So there's relatively little kind of supply here in terms of the supply-demand balance of the, on the stock. But on the flip side of it, we're also IPOing at a time when people are very interested in semiconductor shares. You know, the Philadelphia Semiconductor Index is up very strongly this year, and obviously everybody's very focused on you know, the opportunity that AI is creating for these companies. What about the competitive dynamics? Given that they're getting such a warm reaction today, do you think that this is excitement around the new kid on the block, or is this an idea that will keep sending the other shares higher as well? I mean, it, it, it's a, a yes and no to that. Um, they're really not the new kid on the block. Everybody knows about ARM. They've been around a long time. Their technology is pretty much everywhere. It's used by all of the major chip makers. At the same time, they are pitching themselves as a different company that does way more than just sell the, the bare bones of the IP. IP that, that, mm -hmm. that goes into these chips, you know, they're, they're selling themselves as being much more comprehensive company and, mm -hmm. and having access to, to higher profit margins. Quickly, in here, what about the SoftBank ownership? Given they've only floated about 10%, they will sell more eventually over time, but the governance all points to SoftBank. Is that a plus or a minus? It's a variable. I think that's the, the way to describe it. Obviously, SoftBank will do what SoftBank does in terms of maximizing its profits down the line. It's an investor um, it, it, it's as much as it is a technology company. So that's definitely an overhang or, or a consideration on, on ARM. But at the same time, it, it also gives them perhaps some latitude that other publicly traded companies might not have. Our thanks to Bloomberg's Ian King. We want to touch back in one more time here on Arm Share before we head to commercial break because we are looking at that IPO pop. Not only is the IPO market back, it is back in time for cooler markets. When we are looking at $61 a share here, we are looking at a price here that is almost 20% now more than what we initially had come uh, to price at just last night. Now, what does this mean in terms of valuation? You are watching a company shoot higher very quickly uh, closer to 65 billion dollars in valuation the current valuation at 65 billion dollars would be a little bit higher than what SoftBank had brought back its arm stake for just a couple of weeks ago this is Bloomberg Welcome back to Bloomberg Technology. I'm Shanali Basak. We're going to look quickly at that ARM IPO price. Once again, that uh, first day of trading here, you're getting that IPO pop. You're getting almost a 20% pop in the first day of trading so far. Uh, that is about $60 a share, and it is up meaningfully from the 51 it priced at. At more than $60 billion in valuation, you are getting a price very near what SoftBank had bought back its stake for in ARM. We're going to now bring in Ajay Shah for his read on this. He is the managing director and co-head of the Technology, Media and Telecommunications Group for Deutsche Bank, one of the underwriters on the ARM IPO. When you look at what has happened today, what does it really mean in terms of the companies that can finally make it back to market next? Sorry, sorry about that. Uh, okay. Ajay, actually, yeah. we are going to get right back to you because we are standing by with a pretty key guest for a day like today. That is ARM CEO Rene Haas with our own Caroline Hyde. Caroline. Shanali, it is great to be here with Rene, the CEO of ARM. It is your day. Rene, talk to us about the amount of emails, phone calls, text messages, celebrations, the Cambridge part of your company going berserk. How does it feel? Oh gosh, what an, what an exciting day. You know, I'm hearing from high school friends I have not talked to in a long time <laughs> who are saying, you never told me. Uh, I think as they're watching this on, on, on TV. But most of all, I'm so thrrilled for the employees of ARM. 33-year-old uh, company, great heritage. Um, 
but watching all the employees in Cambridge celebrate simultaneously, that was that was magical. And they might continue to celebrate as we see, what, 17, 18% increase. How has that journey of going out to investors, the road show, the story that you've been able seemingly to successfully sell, the fact that you're trading well on this day, what was the vision they wanted to hear? Revenue growth, I hear of what, 11%, up to 25% in the next couple of years? What drives you? I think uh, it was a great process. Uh, investors really wanted to understand the, the opportunity we had in front of us. And of course, AI, which you can't really talk about our industry without talking about AI. And I think helping them understand that uh, you can't really run AI without ARM, without a CPU, and just pointing out to them that it's in everywhere and every device that people touch was a big part of the process for us. Because everyone has made the equivalent of your smartphones, completely absorbed more than 90% of phones is where your CPUs are. But the design, the fact that you now want to be integral to data centers and the like, how certain are you on the revenue vision, on the profitability vision, even though we see concerns about macro environment still and whether or not we're in an AI hype cycle? Yeah, so AI, uh, AI is everywhere. Uh, and if it's your uh, edge device like the Assistant or the uh, Alexa or your autonomous vehicle, that's all AI. And, and now we're seeing it in the cloud and the data center with all the growth of NVIDIA. NVIDIA announcing one of their newest products, Grace Hopper, that is based on ARM. So ARM is everywhere relative to AI. We also have a very unique business model that gives us the ability to have a very, very good uh, vision in the future in terms of when people use our products. So relative to our confidence in the outlook, uh, we have a very, very high confidence that the growth rate that we have talked about will be sustained. How worried were investors about China and your exposure? I think there were a lot of questions, as you can imagine, about China in general, mm -hmm. uh, given all the geopolitics. Our business there looks a lot like the rest of the world. We have great growth in the data center. We have great growth in the automotive. Uh, China's huge on electric vehicles, so it's been uh, terrific there for us. I have the same kind of uh, headaches that every other tech CEO has regarding how to navigate through this, but no different. Do you think there will be more pressure now that you're public again? Ultimately, I mean, you came to ARM in 2013, you were listed at that point, but it's not been since 2016 that you have been. How does the game change as a leader of that business now? You know, I think there's some things that we were able to do as a private company that will just be different, right? Yeah. Quarterly earnings, making sure that we hit all our commitments. But ARM is not a business you measure from quarter to quarter. Mm -hmm. uh, you measure us over years and decades. And the long-term vision is something that I am very, very passionate about and will continue to drive the company the same way, private or public. You have a lot of key vested interests, whether they be your clients, Apple, TSMC, Intel taking big stakes in the company today. How important are those voices vis-a-vis -vis Masses, the head of SoftBank, who I'm sure you're on the phone to daily? Yeah, so one of the challenges of our industry, in particular with ARM, is that the fact that we're everywhere, uh, none of this works unless we play nice with others. <laughs> so we have to have uh, a lot of engagement with strategic partners and making sure that we're managing that balance, including Masa, our chief shareholder. Do you think he lets more of ARM become public? Is that something you'd like to see? You know, Moss and I talk quite frequently, uh, but it's really not about the day-to-day. -day. It's about the long-term vision, the, the passion that he and I have about the future, and really about what this company can be long-term. So I don't expect that to change, being a public company. Do you think you go public in the UK? I'm sure it's been bittersweet for the London Stock Exchange today. Yeah, so today, obviously, we're in New York, uh, but we're incredibly proud of our UK heritage, and we are opening to considering that down the road. Okay. Any sort of time frame for that? Uh, none that we can talk about today. I'm, I'm trying to get through today a little bit. <laughs> well, before you get through today in that respect, investors do love all things regarding artificial intelligence. But how have you managed to land that your story is different? People have been so exuberant about NVIDIA where you used to work. Yeah. But they're, they're really exuberant about GPUs. How have you said that you are able to claim a larger royalty share of how AI continues to be served? Yeah, so one of, one of the benefits of the Roadshow was spending a lot of time with investors uh, talking about AI and where we fit. And I think one of the misconceptions is that a GPU can run without a CPU, mm -hmm. uh, which is just not the case. Mm -hmm. uh, the CPU is central to every electronics device, and there are devices that ship with a CPU and a GPU. So. Once investors kind of got that, then explaining where the puck was going relative to, gosh, NVIDIA's next generation most advanced product, Grace Hopper, is using ARM CPUs instead of the competition, the light bulb went on. That, oh my gosh, you need the CPU, and at the same time, NVIDIA has made a big bet on ARM in their most sophisticated product. And once that message kind of sunk through, people, the, the light bulb went on as, oh my gosh, I, I get it. There has been this moment, though, at which we're trying to understand how the landscape works 
with global demand and that translating into revenue when you think of Oracle's numbers that came in and look they delivered 30 percent increase when it comes to their cloud provision and, and their AI bet but it doesn't always immediately turn into revenue in the here and the now. How convinced are you that it is going to be in the bottom line evident in the next coming quarters? As far as AI? Mm -hmm. Oh I, I think it's an un questionable that AI, which has already been here, right, for, for a number of years, uh, the chat GPT moment taught us that, oh my gosh, the capability of what this can do going forward has gone up a level. And I think we've seen that over and over in our industry. Uh, there tends to be lightning bolt moments that greatly accelerate the adoption of technology. And I think with AI, as you move towards AGI, computers that can think, uh, I think we now have seen an accelerant for that. Ultimately, down the road, how people make money off that, it'll get figured out. Uh, but AI is here to stay. That's un unquestionable. And it seems as though you're integral to SoftBank's vision of AI and Massa's vision of AI. How can you enunciate a little bit, you say you're talking to him daily, what his vision of ARM within the ecosystem going forward really is? Uh, he and I share a very same view that ARM is one of the most important technology companies uh, in our industry, foundational, uh, if you will. And I would like to see us over the next five to ten years really be recognized that way. And, and he and I are very aligned on that. Uh, as you can imagine, when you think about five to ten years out, there's a lot of things to talk about in terms of the art of the possible, but that's really where he's focused on when his conversations with me. Long-term thinking, but then near-term action, we understand he was pretty... Uh, integral to calling the shots on price points for today's listing. How was that as a just an IPO experience? Did he end up being like, no, we need to leave a little bit of money on the table. This needs to be a successful trade. About all I can say is uh, this is my first road show, so the, uh, everything was a learning experience. We wanted to be at the high end of the range that we set, 47 to 51, and that's where it ended up. So we're happy. We're very thrilled with today. You said that school friends are getting in touch. Can, why have you been hiding this from them? How, how do you feel differently now as a CEO of a publicly traded company? Do you feel differently today? Uh, I feel a little bit differently in looking ahead at this number than what the share price is. That wasn't something we looked at before. But, you know, again, when I, and I told this to employees, while the IPO is amazing and I'm, I could not be more proud of it, I am far more excited about the next five to ten years. And, and that's where my head is focused. Obviously, we need to do things as a public company CEO, but um, I don't feel too much different. And sometimes these are marketing exercises. Mm -hmm. Arm is B2B. But do you think you've become more relevant B2C now? You're saying how people had no idea. Well, that's because largely people don't realize that every day they're interacting yeah. with your designs, with your blueprints. The, the people who need to know what we do, do know. Obviously, just given the fact that all the global partners that we work with. Uh, going forward, how to market ourselves as a public company. That's one of the things as a, a public company CEO I'll spend some time thinking about. Uh, but right now, we're just kind of focused on, uh, on today and, and what that means. And meanwhile, within this exuberant of today, yesterday we saw basically every key chief executive of an AI company, AI related company, uh, indoors in a closed hearing with Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer. Can you tell us about regulation? How do you see the landscape evolving to ensure that you can harness that AI moment? I think it is one of those areas that um, is an unknown moment. And I, I remember talking to an executive about the analogy or metaphor we used was when cars were invented. You mm -hmm. didn't have driver's licenses. Uh, you didn't have lanes. You didn't have rules of the road. There was a lot of things that people had to figure out in terms of uh, taking a, a device that was going to be very, very productive, but could be very dangerous in terms of automobile accidents. AI is a little bit of the same in the sense that we're now in a new paradigm where some, uh, some rules and regulations need to be figured out. And that's why I think you're seeing all this activity around that area. Is the US leading the charge on regulation? Is Europe? Is the UK? Where's getting it right from your perspective? I think all the governments are trying to figure it out. Uh, I know the EU has spent a lot of energy on this, as had the UK. So in terms of who's getting it right, I think it's still early days. And, uh, and everyone's really just trying to learn how technology and this new uh, powerful algorithm will work together. Keep teaching us. Great <laughs> sure. to have some time with you. Renee Thank you House, so much. Of course, the CEO of Arm, the day of their listing. I'm looking at the price point up 17%. So a heady pop for the day's trading, Shanali. Absolutely. Caroline and Renee Haas, Arm CEO, first roadshow. Thank you very much for your time. Now let's bring in Ajay Shah, Deutsche Bank's uh, managing director and co-head of technology, media, and telecommunications for Deutsche Bank, one of the underwriters as we've been talking about. You know, I first want you to react here to what Renee had to say because he did talk about 
about this idea that people will pay for AI related uh, stocks and companies eventually. But we are in a different era than that hyper growth, unprofitable type of company. You had a profit at arm, it was slowing. What is investor appetite for anything but upward trajectory? Yeah, um, certainly. Thanks for having me on the show. Um, look, uh, you know, we have we have definitely seen an uh, increase in uh, uh, activity on the on the capital market side. Uh, certainly, post Labor Day, you know, there was a lot of pent up uh, uh, demand um, and expectation that the markets would open and ARM would indeed open um, the uh, the markets with the IPO. As you've seen, uh, the, the obviously the IPO has done very well so far, and and ARM is really a play on increasing demand for uh, advanced processing uh, needed to support AI and you. Obviously, just heard Rene, you know, walk through uh, some of the some of the key, um, you know, highlights around ARM and why you know people are, um, you know, so uh, much interested in investing in ARM. Um, we have certainly seen, uh, you know, the markets uh, sort of change the tone from, as you said, you know, growth at any cost to uh, growth at, uh, you know, uh, with, with with profitability. Um, and so I think um, investors have been doing work. They have done a lot of work around ARM. They've done work around uh, some of the other. IPOs um, that uh, came to market earlier this year can view uh, on the consumer side, obviously, ARM and in, in, in tech. And we've seen investors do work. Um, and, um, you know, they are still, mm -hmm. obviously, still sensitive on, on valuation. Mm -hmm. But uh, but there is clear appetite to, to pay for growth uh, with with profitability. We have a right. pretty robust pipeline of, of some of these IPOs, um, on, you know, that, that are yet to come. Right. On that pipeline, the reality is there's not that much time left in the year. You really have to file pretty right. soon if you're going to go public. Right. So is the pipeline into next year much bigger? Is it still quite muted given the dynamics we're seeing in the market? There's still a lot of macro uncertainties out there. Sure. Uh, the pipeline is is big, and it is getting bigger by the day. Obviously, with ARM's uh, successful um, IPO, I think you'll see a lot more companies come to market, uh, certainly between now and end of the year, and, and gearing up for next year. We're seeing, um, you know, uh, all across the tech ecosystem, um, you know, on the on the Internet side, there are companies like uh, Reddit or Turo, GoPuff. Uh, in fintech, we've seen, uh, you know, uh, expectations around Stripe and Plaid. Uh, on the software side, you know, you have Genesis, you've got UKG, Rubric and others, and even uh, in the semiconductor uh, space, after uh, you know ARM success, there are companies that uh, you know would uh, certainly like to access the market. Companies like um, an Ampere or a Stera Labs um, and and others. So the pipeline is robust, and we will see the pipeline grow uh, going forward. Uh, obviously, it is going to depend on how ARM does. Uh, you know how investors feel about uh, mm -hmm. the overall strength of the economy, um, and uh, and ultimately what the Fed decides to right. do uh, going forward. Is there a playbook here? On one hand, you did see them kind of tamper down expectations in order to get this smooth debut. On the other hand, there's a cross current that seems to be peeking its head up in the market, which is M&A. Is there a reality that M&A can meaningfully compete with the IPO markets and what will give a company a better exit valuation? Yeah, so the M&A market has uh, has slowed down uh, this year relative to years past, um, and uh, you know, with with the IPO market, you know, showing uh, signs of, of opening, uh, that is a, a real competition to um, you know companies looking to acquire. So I, I do see uh, the opportunity for um, M&A also to increase going forward. Again, uh, not just because the IPO market is strong, but also valuations are um, you know increasing. They're they're stronger than than what they were last year. We've seen, um, you know, S&P up 17 percent, Nasdaq up 32 percent. The VIX volatility index is down 40 percent. Uh, and so I, th I think those are factors that uh, certainly corporates look at when they think about M&A. And now there is a real option for companies to go uh, go public. Um, so we, we do expect uh, companies to start, um, you know, looking at uh, more corporate M&A. We've seen some financial sponsors and private equity deals happen in the market. We haven't seen as many, you know, corporate M&A, but uh, again, with the robust in the market uh, and the economy starting to uh, starting to grow, um, we do expect um, M&A market also to pick up pretty so, materially in the next year. Also, think about here is that this is not a U.S.-based company, but listed in the United States now. Are you scouring the globe for hopefuls, just given that valuations might be more reasonable outside of the United States? 
Absolutely. Um, there are, um, you know, several um, companies, um, obviously in, in Asia and Europe, that have been waiting uh, for ARM and, and a few other IPOs that will come out, um, you know, between now and the end of the year. And, and we will see um, increase in uh, certainly either cross-border listings or uh, just listing in, in, in Europe and, and Asia. But we are uh, working with a handful of companies that are looking to go public, uh, you know, across uh, both sides of the, uh, of the continent. That is Ajay Shah. He's managing director and co-head of TMT for Deutsche Bank's investment bank. Thank you very much for your time. Now joining us here in studio is Cameron Ansari. He's headline venture capital partner for his read on the IPO landscape and other paths to exit. We've been talking here about IPOs versus M&A. There's another question I wanted to ask you, though. There's been a lot of fireworks about this idea of VCs holding on too long when you go into public markets. How do you see that playing out? Do you think that there will be more willingness to to start to sell into an IPO rather than hold on and clip the gains over time. Yeah, I mean, I think that you're going to see in the ARM case, you really only have one seller, which is SoftBank, uh, and it's not a traditional venture-backed IPO, though the way they might consider it. You know, SoftBank took it private seven years ago and is bringing it back out now today. Uh, but you have a couple other companies coming up this week uh, or in the next 10 days, uh, Clavio and Instacart, which are both venture-backed uh, you know, startups, quote-unquote, in the traditional sense. And I think in both those cases, you'll see the venture investors uh, selling into the IPO in a meaningful way, but it's also going to be a liquidity event for the company and the employees, as well as a fundraising event, right? It's an event for the company to actually raise funds and capital uh, so they can shore up the balance sheets as well. It's been a bit of a strange year. Uh, when you think about the hopefuls and companies that are going public, there is some hope around fintech. There's a lot of consumer. There's a lot of food and delivery. But how much is AI the real silver bullet? Do you think that it's a red herring? Or do you think that there's um, more opportunity elsewhere? Well, look, Arm is one of the only plays right now for consumers and retail investors, as well as investors generally, to play into the AI kind of um, theme, other than maybe owning Microsoft as a pass-through to OpenAI or Google as a pass-through to BARD um, or NVIDIA, right? There really aren't many public opportunities to, to play the, the um, kind of boom in AI. Uh, but I do think it's a little bit of a red herring and that there's a lot of opportunities elsewhere and a lot of the companies that are um, going to be listing and coming out, including Clavio and Instacart and, you know, we talked about um, Reddit or Intercom or Databricks or some of these companies that are coming out. They're not AI businesses per se. They're terrific companies uh, and they're going to do very well. And I think the one that in the tech space and the fintech space where I spend a lot of time everyone's waiting for is Stripe. So I think Stripe's going to be the big bellwether, uh, and, but that's not likely to happen When this do you year. think it actually goes? Who knows, right? They raised the massive fundraising round uh, very recently at, at a steep discount, uh, about a 50% discount. They were previously priced at $95 billion. They raised it about $50 billion to really shore up the balance sheet and also primarily to um, incentivize employees and keep them around because of a stock option plan that was expiring. Uh, so with that fundraising, I think they have a, a lot more runway now. So I'm guessing that's, that's easily going to be well into 2024 before Stripe is going to come out. Now, you think about Instacart, and it is a big win for some of the early investors, including D1, where D1, Dan Sundime, for example, they had uh, roughly 60% of their assets invested in venture capital and private equity. It's been a drag on returns. When you look at those crossover funds, those big hedge funds that have come into the market, yep. what role do you think that they play now that they're finally starting to exit a little more now? Well, going forward, and really this year, it's been very quiet with those guys. You know, We used to see Tiger and Co2 and SoftBank and a lot of these funds coming into earlier stage opportunities in the venture space, sometimes even like seed deals, which is very strange. Uh, they've been pretty quiet, and you're also hearing about some of those funds trying to sell their positions or package up all the, all the positions in a secondary. So I think going forward, you know, I expect to see less of those folks coming into really early stage venture deals. But, you know, in the case of Instacart, you also have, you know, one of the you know, greatest venture funds, Sequoia, is one of the major holders. You have traditional venture firms in there as well that'll be um, looking to hopefully, uh, you know, I think get out as part of the IPO. Now, as they get out, how do you think that changes the dynamic around valuations, given we've seen so many down rounds already this year? Well, it's, you know, it's, it's been a market reset, right? And in the case of Instacart, I think the last private round was in the $39 billion range. I think they've priced it very attractively, frankly, at $9 billion, which is actually, if you look at the comp, which is DoorDash, which, which trades at four times revenue, uh, Instacart's around a $3 billion revenue business. So the fair price should probably be closer to $11, $12 billion. So I think pricing it at 9 leaves room for upside. Um, but it's a, it's a vast reset, right? And we've seen that with Stripe, with Klarna in the, in the private markets, as well as in the public markets, you know, the companies like, like PayPal and Square Block, they're all down 
60-70% from their 2021 highs. And I think that's consistent across the board. You look at what you're seeing in ARM today, you're looking at almost a 20% pop, more than a 17% yeah. pop at the moment. It has been trading in and around more than 20 times its trailing uh, sales. Uh, do you look at these companies and say that's achievable or is that a one-off? I, I think ARM itself is, is really a one-off in terms of uh, the type of company it is that, again, the play on AI in the current moment, uh, the size and scale of the business, the partners they have, we have these very stable relationships with folks like uh, Samsung and Google and Apple. So, you know, at the same time, it's, it's, a, it's a slow growth business in a high growth sector, right? They're not really growing right now. Uh, they've had kind of a flat uh, last year, and I think they're going to start to grow again this year. So the story is not a perfect story, um, and yet you're seeing, you know, obviously a, a 15, 20 percent uh, a pop as, as, as already happening. But, you know, there are also non-tech names coming out. We, we started this IPO kind of uh, wave these last few months with Kava, so it took kind of PETA and Hummus to get us here. Uh, and now, you know, I heard yesterday you saw on the news that Birkenstock's coming out, which is, again, a non-tech name uh, that's going to come out and, I think, drive interest as well. It's no secret. Birkenstocks is now my new IPO attire. Wore them to work this yeah. morning. Yeah. Bir <laughs> Birkenstock will be a public stock. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> uh, the cameraman, I'm sorry. Headline Venture Partner, we thank you so very much for your time. Now, let's take it home with Bloomberg's Caroline Hyde, who's been on the ground at NASDAQ for us, looking at that 15% or so pop at the ARM IPO uh, just right out of the gate, just about an hour ago. What's next? Yeah, what's next? Clavio, Instacart, all of the eyes on these companies coming next week, and they're going to be from the NASDAQ, they're going to be from the New York Stock Exchange. There is going to continue to be an eye on really how this company continues to perform. We know that there's exuberance around the first day of trade. How does ARM manage to continue this narrative of growth if in the face of China? I thought that was notable from Rene Haas talking about, look, it's the same headache as every other CEO who's exposed to China is currently having. I think it's also on the road for ARM and Destiny really interesting that he told us that they are potentially eyeing a UK listing, so a secondary listing at some point. That was news that they gave to us, so I think that's an important step in terms of reminding everyone this is a global company with global exposure, but also a global headquarters. It's UK-based. And then what for SoftBank? Of course, this is a company now that is trying to show that they're back winning when it comes to their venture bets. This has been a 70% upside for Masayoshi Sun, and he's also taken a very hands-on approach to how he's guided this IPO. How will the rest of the IPOs be able to deliver those sorts of returns for their VCs? and indeed managed to sustain the growth story and indeed managed to see a pop on the first day of trade. As Karen Snow from NASDAQ was telling us, Shanali, this is largely an art as well as a science. They try and make it as much of a science as they can with their technology, but under, at the end of the day, this does tend to be an art of getting the right price point. Something I had heard him tell you, Rene Haas, was that this was his first roadshow. It's interesting because you think about the list of IPOs uh, around the corner and the entrepreneurs that are trying to make it to market and the role these under writers play some old, some new, Goldman's big day, the fact that they're playing such a big role in the technology market, Mizuho just coming up swinging not only in this IPO but some of the ones next week as well. What did he tell you on the sidelines about what it felt like to, to be listing such a massive company in the market right now for the first time? I mean, I do think he's trying to keep his his emotions contained. And look, he was where well, he was telling us that friends that he knew since college were getting in touch, saying they had no idea. This is a B two B play, less than an Instacart B two C. And I'm so sure Fiji over at Instacart is getting a lot more friends who recognise she's about to have a slog to get this company to go public as well. But notably, this has been very idiosyncratic in the way that they've democratised their banks, the way in which they've had so many underwriters, really taking a leaf out of Alibaba's book here. How can that? be replicated? How can they ensure? Also, interestingly, with Instacart, they're going to be depending not on so much the institutional players and the integral players like an Apple, TSMC, and customers. Instead, they're going to be basing their focus on retail investor. And of course, that's why, so interestingly, SoFi is coming to play an underwriting role there. So I'm going to be interested as to how they sell that narrative, not just to the business population, but to the public too, Shanali. Right. Instacart would be SoFi's first underwritten IPO. Now, last question here, Caroline, for you, because down at the NASDAQ, you're also interviewing NASDAQ. Dex executives direct um, listings. The, the, the business that includes listings is about 20% of last year's total revenue. How do they feel about the market finally coming back? Buoyant. 
God. Everyone I've spoken to has a smile on their face. They look relatively exhausted, have not sleep, slept for a few days, but they cannot wait for this really pendulum to swing back open. They've totally said, Karen Snow, as you were referencing, head of global listings, saying that there are so many companies waiting to come out. 157, of course, have filed, looking to really access this window. She feels it could shut by, well, the 2024 elections. Many want to get ahead of that sort of political environment. So if we can sustain some sort of lack of volatility in the markets and some appetite for these companies coming forward, there is a whole host of companies that want to start listing and want to start listing soon. Yeah, that timeline certainly makes sense, let alone the October government shutdown and a whole host of other potential things that could get in the way. Bloomberg's Caroline Hyde, we thank you so very much for your time and your incredible interviews at a pretty pivotal moment watching that RMIPO open interviews just around that. Uh, now that does it for this edition of Bloomberg Technology, the IPO edition. Coming up next, uh, you don't forget to check out that podcast. You can find it on the terminal. You can find it online as well as on Apple, Spotify, and iHeart. This is Bloomberg.